Listen now for the word of God. In those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Lord, I pray that you would pour through me the word that you would have us here this morning. Just a small word, a brief word that will, that will be your word to us as we go out into the day. And Lord, I pray that it be not my opinion, but your word that will touch us at our point of need. Touch each one of us at our point of need and strengthen us and equip us to be the people that you are calling us to be. And I pray this, I pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Well, last night we had uh, a service here at 11 o'clock, music at 10.30, and we had a family service at 4 o'clock, and it was wonderful. And there was something that I had begun the, the message last night with that I'd like to share with you briefly today. And it was just that there was a series of commercials that ran a few years ago and from a major supplier of, of baby care products. And it was addressed to people who perhaps had waited a little longer than most, a little longer than the norm to have a family. And this series of advertisements expressed the joy and the sweetness and the wonder at a redirection of one's priorities, a redefining of one's joys, a radical and comprehensive change of life, of one's life. And one of the television spots shows a mother bathing her son in the kitchen sink. And the baby's head is hairless, and the body type is rather like Buddha. And there was a toothless grin on his face. And the voiceover says, I used to think I wanted tall, dark, and handsome. Who knew that my heart would be captured by someone bald and pudgy? <laughs> a baby changes everything. And that's what we spoke about yesterday. That's what I offered you today, that a baby changes everything. And not just a baby, but this baby. This baby whom we have come to celebrate this day. And yet, I looked at my life when I got here 18 years ago, and my wife and I had a two-year-old and one that was on the way, and it changed, it uprooted, it was marvelous in our life. And what we learned was that we learned a different priority, a different way of looking at our priorities. Uh, we also learned a different humility. The things that might, might have been repugnant or embarrassing before became just uh, the regular course of each day. And then we got a glimpse, I believe, of how God looks on us and how we are to look on God's people, each one of us on each other, in a matter of service, in a matter of, in a matter of being godly. You know, I, I tend to go off script on a morning like this just because I think it's what, uh, such a wonderful opportunity just to talk about the mystery and the enormity of what happened 2,000 years ago. You know, it's a mystery. I don't understand it. There's a lot of doctrine. We're not so doctrinaire here at Second Presbyterian Church. You can look through our polity and you can look through this doctrine of such and such and such and such. And that's not necessarily what you hear from the pulpit. What you hear from the pulpit is Jesus Christ. And it's a mystery. It's a mystery that doesn't need to be solved. It's a mystery that cannot be explained. Uh, we are looking at various creeds throughout the life of the church from 2,000 years to today. And the one that we spoke today, I believe, was in the words of the Apostles' Creed that was from the fourth century. Using fourth century language and, and a fourth century attempt to explain that which cannot be explained. So what we do is we come here and 
beyond the trappings and beyond the doctrine, we point to Jesus. That's what we get to do. The mystery, the reality of Jesus. And I often say, rather than being explained, it's something that must be experienced. Something to which we open our hearts and our experience. And once we open our hearts, then the Holy Spirit, who is not a party crasher, once we open our hearts, the Spirit comes in and our lives are forever changed. And that's what we get to talk about here at the Second Presbyterian Church. We hold in remembrance the holy truth that God came to put things right. God came to put things right. Born to save us. And he will. But first, must melt our hearts. Appearing not as a sage or as a philosopher or an emperor, but as a shuddering little child with no home. A refugee. He disarms us with tender vulnerability and summons us to enter into his world as a little child. And there was a, an Episcopal priest that I really admire. Her name is Barbara Brown Taylor. She is a wonderful preacher and wonderful writer. And then she said this. She said, God addresses humanity with this impassioned plea. God says, I am so crazy in love with you. I'm so crazy in love with you that I will come all the way to where you are to be the flesh of your flesh and the bone of your bone. And I will do it all. God says, I will do it all. And all you have to do is believe that I love you the way you are. Believe that I love you the way you are. Love you enough to become one of you. Love you to my death. You know, that's recorded in the narrative sweep of the Bible in the first testaments that pointed to a suffering Savior. And then all through the, the, the second testament, the New Testament, God is a God of love. Oftentimes we'll begin the worship service here and I'll say, God is love and those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. And then together we say, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and let us be glad in it. There was a, each year, the Radio City Christmas Spectacular. Have you all seen that? Who's seen it? Show of hands, anybody? <laughs> Good. Each year, uh, they close with the Living Nativity. Now, did you know that the fellow that put that show together uh, was about to retire? And as he was about to retire, the people who were continuing with the uh, Radio City Music Hall Spectacular negotiated with him so they could continue what had become a tradition at Christmas time in New York City. And they said, of course, well, we won't have this living nativity. And he said, what? Well, no, well, no. I mean, we have no need to do that. You know, it's a, the world's a very different place now, and you must recognize. So uh, just sign right here. <laughs> and he wouldn't. And he didn't. And so he, you find every time you go to New York to Radio City Music Hall during the season, you see the living nativity. It was the same thing with uh, Charlie Brown. Do you know this? Have you seen the Charlie Brown Christmas show, the special, you know? Uh, in my former life, I was a television producer, and I produced biographies for the Arts and Entertainment Network. So I produced uh, a biography on Charles Schultz. And the same thing happened. People looked at him and they said, this is really a moneymaker, this uh, little bald boy. You heard about him, huh? Little bald boy with a, with a crazy sweater. Said, so what we'd like to do would be to uh, have your basic Christmas story about the tree and so on, but we won't read the scripture. And he said, what? No, no, we won't be reading the scripture. That, that's too defining. That's too narrow. He said, well, then you don't do the show. That's what he said. And guess what? Every time you see the Christmas Spectacular, you see the Charlie Brown show on TV, they read the story. See, we have power. We have power and we have leverage as we look to be the people of God. So one thing that I really like to do each year is to read from that living uh, nativity, the text. What it said was, he was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. And then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never had a family or owned a home. He never set foot inside a big city. 
He never traveled 200 miles from the place he was born. He never wrote a book or held an office. He did none of these things that usually accompany greatness. And while he was still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends deserted him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And while he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had, his coat. And when he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a borrowed grave. Now 20, 21 centuries have come and gone. And today, this solitary life is the central figure for much of the human race. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, and all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of humanity upon this earth as powerfully as this one solitary life. Christ comes that we may begin again. We can start anew, we can purge the toxins, we can cast aside the attitudes and the behaviors that separate us from our neighbors, from our best, from our God. Yes, we get another chance. We get another chance at Christmas. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you for these moments together. We thank you for the chance afterwards to, to say hello to each other and to share that which we are and that which we need that which we worship. So Lord, be with us in these moments and as we go from this place. May your word and the reality of who you have been, but who you are, inform each waking moment of our lives. May it be so. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.